As I said before, I'm Sarah Shevchuk, and I am a clinical psychologist currently licensed in New York State, and I work for the Office of Mental Health for an inpatient state psychiatric hospital. I'm a unit psychologist, and I'm part of a multidisciplinary team, and on my particular unit, we service um, an all-female population. I work with a lot of uh, borderline personality disorders, a lot of uh, co-occurring disorders, and I also provide a lot of group therapy and milieu treatment for a variety of patients within the system. When something is difficult to study in great detail, it's often difficult to identify pretty obvious principles. Um, you may have heard the expression, he can't see the forest for the trees. So thinking about what that means, the opposite can also be true. So if a person takes a very broad perspective when they're studying neuroanatomy, they can also miss key details. So I want to just spend a couple of minutes going over a few slides to help people understand some discoveries um, by biopsychologists who took these general approaches that helped us really start to understand what goes on. Um, in the nervous system at a neuronal or The nervous system is the division of our nervous system, as many people know, that's located within the skull and the spine. The peripheral nervous system is everything outside of the skull and the spine. We refer to these um, as the CNS or central nervous system or the PNS, which is the peripheral. So we have the CNS, which is our control center for everything, and then the periphery or everything outside the brain and spinal cord is really all of our, our relay station or our communication lines between the brain and spinal cord and the rest These of folks the recognize the role of physiological arousal in our cognitive processes as well as our emotional experience, and they predict that the cognitive component includes considering the context in which our arousal has occurred. So here, the cognitive piece is what matters. Next, we have Ken and Bard, and in this theory, it's proposing that bodily and emotional reactions to something in the environment occur simultaneously. So here, it's like the cognitive and the emotional piece happening at the same time, unlike Schachter and Singer, which is saying that this cognitive piece is first. And then we have the James Lund theory, and here they propose that emotions represent our bodily reaction. To considerable attention has also been um, devoted to the investigation of all these neurochemical and neuroanatomical systems that are part of substance-seeking behavior specifically. So in healthy people, neurotransmitters are going to work in a way, like in a pattern of stimulation or inhibition that affects spreading downward like a cascade. So from a stimulus input to the complex pattern of response or whatever, you're going to get to that point where you have a feeling of well-being. So although this neurotransmitter system is completely complex and still not really completely understood, the main central reward areas in that system. separation between biology and psychology is finally yay, diminishing. Research has revealed erroneous conclusions that have been relayed as a result of scientific discovery. But we know that attachment alters genes. We know that attachment and psychotherapy alter brain chemistry. We know that learning-based experiences alter neurons and that potentiation of these synaptic transmissions require activation. Strength can be experience-dependent and talking in meaningful ways we know alters brain biochemistry. Psychotherapy alters structures of the brain. And we also know that it has its limits that it's not an intellectual exchange of words and is more than a conversation. We know that the therapist and the patient are having this mutually regulating attachment relationship, which is potent for change. And it's experience, not explanations or ideas that really affects change. So emotional neutrality does work, but attachment theory does not recommend that the therapist try to attain it, strive to attain it. So that's what I was saying. So you may be neutral, when treating someone with an addiction because you know that that neutral stance or you're accustomed to that neutral stance doesn't solicit even more reactions out of the other person. But from this perspective, it's not the point of what we're doing. It's not the aim. It's not the goal.